Okay, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Espero haya tenido un There have been Everybody's had a very good lunch, or there was a very good lunch, I believe, after the very productive, productive session that we had this morning. First of all, to welcome to the panelists, the expert panelists and moderator for panel four, for this panel four, before we begin our discussions of this afternoon, we will let, uh, watch a short video clip for the doc from the documentary voices across the divide. I was born in West Jerusalem in 1941. It happened when I'm younger, I remember it exactly. When in 1948, my father came home and he told my mother that there is a neighbor across the street from us was killed and he said, by the evening, by six o'clock, we have to go. So he get the whole family in the taxi. I remember running, I said, just can I take my doll? I love to take this little doll with me. And he said, just run and get it. And my mom, she has a baby, 15 days old. So she grabbed her jewelry, wrap it in the receiving blanket of the baby, and she throws us all in the car, and we left. So we went to Syria. And my father thought, we're coming back to our home and furniture and everything, so let's enjoy Syria. So we rented the house, and we lived in the house for a while. And things got worse. We, uh, my mom used all her jewelry for renting the homes or food and everything, and then the money is gone, and my father started finding jobs and no jobs. So things get worse. We stayed two years in misery in Syria. So we said, we have to go back. Thank you. I think it's a good beginning for our discussion of this uh, afternoon. I would like now to inaugurate the fourth discussion panel of the forum titled Ways Forward to Achieve Sus a Sustainable Peace. Over the past one and a day, uh, one and a half days, we have listened to discussions on um, past developments and issues, which are all continuing into the present time. Now it is the time that we look forward to hear about ideas for the solutions in the future. For that, it is my really great pleasure to introduce Mr. Fateh Hassan, Policy Advisor, Al Shabaka, and an affiliate at the Middle East Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School. He was Senior Fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy and previous, previously held posts as director for the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship, Middle East Regional Representative of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, director of Forced Migrations and Refugee Studies at the American University in Cairo, and director of the Palestinian organization al Haq. May I request Mr. Assam to introduce the speakers and moderate uh, the panel, please. Mr. Assam, you have the floor and once again, very welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Rodriguez. And please, before I begin, may I uh, express our sadness to hear about this um, afternoon uh, airplane crash uh, of a flight leaving Havana. We don't really have a lot of information yet, but Please, please accept our, our best wishes for the news not to be too bad. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the last of the panels of this, uh, of this meeting, and uh, a very important one in that it is looking forward in, in terms of thinking about what could be the ways forward for uh, achieving a sustainable peace. Now, sadly, the stalemate today, the political stalemate, does not <clears throat> inspire very much hope for ways forward in achieving this sustainable peace. But of course, loss of hope is an admission of defeat. And as far as I can tell, nobody's admitted defeat yet. So we keep continuing and we keep thinking ahead 
for what can be done and where we should go from here. Um, but where we go is also difficult given the current political climate uh, internationally and within the region as well. And it's a climate that uh, is, seems to be, uh, there seems to be a regional and global shift away from UN principles of peaceful resolution of conflict, a shift away from UN principles of uh, respect for human rights and the rule of law and the peaceful resolution of conflict. So uh, let me suggest that we don't dwell too much on these problems, but being very aware of this very difficult uh, political uh, environment uh, in terms of thinking ahead. We have uh, a very good panel with us today, and to begin with, let me uh, just pose a couple of questions uh, that might help frame the discussion a little bit, and then, of course, uh, all of our panelists will present their, their points of view uh, in terms of pragmatic solutions. Uh, focusing on short and medium goals, short and medium strategies that we can actually employ to keep moving forward. A big question that's facing us all that everybody is asking is whether or not the two-state solution is dead or whether it remains the only game in town. And that is a subject for ongoing discussion uh, and debate. But of course, a two-state solution or a one-state solution and the various permutations of a one-state solution, be it a democratic secular state, be it a confederation of sorts, be it the necessity of, as Hanan Ashrawi was saying in the first panel, that we need uh, to at least have a step where Palestinian rights to self-determination are uh, achieved in, at the very least, an interim before we even think about uh, bigger solutions like one state uh, and, and you know, and, and, or a confederation or, or any other such uh, permutation. We don't know. But what we do know is that we need to frame our thinking for the future in terms of sustainability, as we said in previous panels, uh, in the idea of recognition of the historic realities and uh, the, re the recognition of you know, what can be done in terms of pragmatic uh, frameworks and uh, the framework of international law and respect for human rights uh, globally. Uh, so with, with those thoughts in mind, uh, I'm going to introduce each panelist as they speak rather than speak to everybody. And I would like to ask, if possible, uh, Ms. Phyllis Bennis to be, to be our first uh, introducer. Uh, Ms. Bennis is a fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., and of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. She's, she was a co-founder and remains on the steering committee of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation and co-chairs the International Coordinating Network on Palestine. She's uh, been very active for many years, and, and her books include Calling the Shots, How Washington Dominates Today's U.N., that was in 1996, I don't think much has changed since. Um, understanding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, a primer in 2003, and challenging empire, how people, governments, and the UN defy US power. Um, so without further ado, Ms. Bennis, please, uh, let's talk about seven, eight minutes, and then we'll proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatah, and thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'd also like to thank Ilio and the team at the Division for Palestinian Rights who have worked incredibly hard and continue to do so, putting all of this together and bringing us all here. Um, on the quick question of the two-state solution, is it over or is it the only game in town, I would say yes and no. Um, but I think that more importantly than my position on it, I'm a Jewish girl from California, it's not up to me to say how many states there should be. I think that the question is, what do we have today that we're looking at and what needs to change to bring about conditions of freedom and liberation for Palestinians in whatever political arrangement uh, that may be? So I think that if we look at the situation for Palestinians today, what we see, and we heard this yesterday, we hear it many times, is that there is one state. You can call it an entity, you can call it whatever you want, but there's one piece of land with one governing power, 
the Israeli government and the Israeli military is in control. There are at least two separate legal structures within which people live, under which people live in that territory, in that one territory, uh, and which legal system you are accountable to depends on your ethnicity and religion. That's by definition a violation of the international covenant against the crime of apartheid. So I think that's our starting point. That's what we have today. The question of is an end to occupation, an end to violations of human rights, and an end to inequality, is that best served by dividing that, that one territory into two or by keeping one territory as it is today but fighting for equality within it? I'm not going to call out which one of those I think is more important because I don't think that's my call. What I do think is important is that for those of us, particularly in civil society, that we keep the focus on what needs to be accomplished, that our own governments demand positions based on international law, human rights, and equality for all. If there are one state, you need all those things within that one state. If there are two states, you need all those things within both states and between both states, a crucial aspect which is never on the international diplomatic agenda. I think that when we talk about ending occupation as a, a fundamental, that's absolutely right. It is critical. It is also not enough to tell us what's the form in which that takes. So we do have to fight for an end to occupation as we fight for international law, meaning all of international law, the right to self-determination, the right of refugees to return, the right of Palestinian citizens of Israel to live as equal citizens and not as third or fourth or fifth class citizens. So we come here today <coughs> at another of so many tragic moments of crisis for Palestine. For Palestine and Palestinians, the recent days has been a reminder once again of the human price that is paid over and over and over again for Israeli lack of accountability, for Israeli impunity, for the denial of human rights, for the violation of international law, and the rejection of equality. What we see, what we saw on Monday, is a reflection of all of those things. And I want to focus on the role of civil society because I believe that what we have learned over the last 25 years of diplomacy is that diplomacy in its current form has not worked. It does not mean we can abandon diplomacy. Diplomacy is how governments engage and governments hold power. So we need to engage with power. We need to engage with our governments. We need to engage with diplomacy. But if we are looking for where will we find the leadership, the creativity, the energy to continue the fight to end the occupation, the fight for equality, I think we have to look beyond the United Nations, beyond our own governments, to our civil society, which will then take on, as our opponents, if you will, those institutions. Let me just raise one thing from 15 years ago. I had the privilege of speaking before the General Assembly's annual day to commemorate the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. This was in 2003. And this was one of the a few lines that I said at that time. This was addressing the, the General Assembly. As representatives of all the member states of the United Nations, as constituents of the most democratic organ within the UN family, you, excellencies, hold a grave responsibility. The re protection of those languishing under military occupation lies in your hands. The restoration of human rights to those illegally denied such rights is your obligation. The defense of those unable to protect themselves is your burden. Until now, I am sorry to say, that responsibility, that obligation, that burden, all remain unmet. That was 15 years ago. I would unfortunately say that not a whole lot has changed. If we look at the lives of people living under military occupation, refugees denied their right to go home, and Palestinians forced to live as third or fourth or fifth class citizens inside Israel. Civil society around the world has done extraordinary work and has changed the discourse in amazing ways. We are now hearing the word Nakba as a, as a given. We're here at the, at the UN holding a two-day conference on the Nakba. That hasn't happened before. 
We see the word Nakba on the front page of the New York Times. That didn't used to happen. We see a massive shift in the discourse. And yet, the president of my country speaks of refugees as animals. I don't know how many of you caught that a couple of days ago. The latest verbal atrocity of the White House. And when he says things like that, what does that say to children in my country who want to know how to think about refugees and immigrants? Refugees including Palestinian refugees. When immigrants are called, all immigrants as far as we know, are called animals. But we have done amazing work. Two years ago, three years ago now, 60 members of Congress skipped the speech of Prime Minister Netanyahu when he came to coerce them into voting against their president to prevent the Iran nuclear deal. 60 members. That had never happened before. That would not have happened if we had not been able to change the discourse in such a way that it was no longer political suicide to challenge Israel in the halls of the US Congress, or in this case, outside of Congress, because they refused to go. The reason that the boycott, divestment, sanctions campaigns in the United States and Britain are under attack is because of their success. Not because they're not working, it's precisely because they are working that they are under attack. It's a sign of the success of that. And I think when we look at the media, when we look at the rest of those shifts, the BDS movement globally has played a huge role in changing how people look at this crisis, not least by saying it's not just about one state, two state, red state, blue state. It's about rights. It's about international law. And it's about equality in however many states there may be. So I want to focus for the remaining few minutes I have just on the question of what we might do about that. So one of the things to look at when we talk about, we talked this morning, I think, in a very powerful way about the, the model of Namibia, the Namibian struggle. The South African struggle against apartheid is a huge, important model for us. It's also an important model for our movement. The South African movement globally against apartheid, led by the ANC, who had a very clear international strategy, was crucial in supporting that movement and that struggle. One of the, the ways that that happened was that civil society pressured their own governments to allow the United Nations, when the United States was saying no dice, the United States didn't come on board till very, very late in the game, when they felt they had no choice, they were too isolated. But before that, the UN was able to pass a number of key resolutions that allowed and encouraged members of the General Assembly to, for example, refuse to deal militarily with South Africa. Why can't the General Assembly today vote, understanding that it will not be a unanimous vote, but there is no veto, vote to encourage member states to refuse to purchase Israeli weapon systems? Israel is one of the key exporters of lethal weapons around the world that are used in some of the worst wars around the world. They are also one of the key exporters of police and surveillance equipment that is being used to suppress protesters, to suppress black and brown communities in my country. It is something that much of the world can unite on and does not require the United States to agree. So the notion of identifying Israeli military exports as a target of a new kind of boycott. It's not a sanction. There's no punishment. If a government decides to, uh, to purchase arms from Denmark or Sweden, Sweden makes a lot of arms. Buy them from Sweden. Don't buy them from Israel. You know, that can be a very successful kind of campaign. And I think that as civil society steps up to build the partnership with the United Nations to encourage the UN to encourage its member states. We see the possibilities for the UN to do what its charter demands that it do, to stand against the scourge of war. And I would say the scourge of war and occupation in the entire world. We can build that kind of a global movement. We can have it led by civil society. We can have participation from the United Nations and governments around the world will take the opportunity to say, we want to be on the right side of history. We don't want historians to look back and say, we were on the wrong side then. We were wrong. We should have. 
we should have done X, we should have done Y. We are doing them a favor by providing a framework that says the United Nations stands with civil society against occupation, against impunity, that we demand to have levels of accountability that we have not had, and that can be the most successful kind of civil society and UN work that perhaps any of us have done so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. And, then, and I must say, given those suggestions, you know, I think there's plenty of support for that in the legal requirements within the United Nations, such as the recent uh, principles on uh, uh, principles for you know business and human rights, for example, uh, that have been uh, that are being developed. Plus, uh, you know, the requirement to not do any harm in any of the dealings with respect to respect for human rights. Our next speaker, uh, we will turn to uh, youth, to Mr. Obad Ashtaya, who is the regional director of the One Voice Movement for the Mid-Atlantic Region. Uh, between 2015 and 2017, he was a Fulbright Scholar at George Mason University School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution and uh, he holds a BA in English Literature from Al-Najah National University in Palestine. He's a founder of the One Voice Movement and the One Voice on Campus Fellowship Program, which provides American students with an opportunity to engage in constructive activism surrounding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, so let's hear some perspectives from youth, Mr. Steya. <coughs> as the youth constitute the majority of uh, the Palestinian population. <coughs> Does that work now? Yeah, you're good. Great. Let's stay close to the yeah. mic. So yeah, I was saying the youth constitute the, the majority of the Palestinian uh, population. And let me start by giving the youth a little bit of credit here. As the youth have been historically leading the struggle against the Israeli occupation, the youth have been the preservers and the pursuers of our national project whether it's from the time of the PLO when um, after the Nakba that befell the Palestinians in 1948, the youth got together and started organizing political parties. And then they came up with the PLO and they continue, the PLO continues its struggle against occupation till today. And then youth who were born around the 1967 um, lived in that weird period where they were like, so it's in 66 Palestinian citizens of Israel got their citizenships and you know there was this uh, idea at one point that it might be the beginning of something in the future, where as everybody is going to have rights, and you know we're going to have a, a, a one state of some kind. But then, as soon as they realize that this is not the case, that they continue to be under the military Israeli law, when Israeli general is the minister of education for the Palestinians or the minister of health and so forth. In '87, they rebelled against the occupation one more time. And then the PLO used that. I believe um, a lot of people uh, believe that uh, it was the basis for Oslo, which again, when it crashed and the Palestinians realized that this is not going any anywhere, and this is the generation that was born around the, the first intifada but didn't participate in it, they started the second intifada. And now those youth who were born around that time are starting the Gaza protests and, and Jerusalem. What we see here is a pattern it's almost a generational pattern of like youth re rebelling, and then it's it's a little bit of a slow. The, the the kids are growing up, and then another rebellion. And what that tells us is that youth are never gonna give up until they get their rights. But it also tells us it, this is linear. But it's also a cycle. It's a cycle of violence that taxes youth, their mm -hmm. lives. They they die. They go to prison. Um, they are prohibited from pursuing what other youth around the world are pursuing. You know, just typical stuff, school and this and that and the other thing. And this is a massive responsibility on all of us to work to break this cycle of violence. And I want to say a word actually about the youth of today. So the youth of today, I think, are a little bit unique. They have in front of them interesting models. So they saw the history of the Palestinian cause. They saw the wars. They saw the first intifada, the second intifada. And there's this, I think, cost-benefit analysis that is going on. 
especially when, looks, when we look at the second intifada, there was a lot of cost that the Palestinians had to pay. Tremendous cost. The benefit, not so much. This is one. The second thing from the perspective of the youth of today is that they live in a globalized world. The internet allows them to go and look at youth living around the world and they're like, so their aspirations are not the same aspirations that their parents and grandparents. They want to go beyond that. One more thing is, is on the political and, and like speaking politically, I think they're more creative and less partisan. So uh, polls show if you, do, if you don't uh, make the, the youth uh, forcibly almost Nepal choose between Hamas and Fatah, um, most of the time they are nonpartisan. Oh, uh, so at some point there was 50% nonpartisan youth. Um, and all those things, I believe, lead us to what I call um, the Project X of the youth. Youth have this, this thing in mind. They know for sure that they want to get rid of the occupation. And each one of them, and it's, it's X because it's not one thing. It's the accumulation of everything that the youth are trying to do. Some of them are studying incubators and they're entrepreneurs. Others are working in theater and art and this, that, and the other thing. Some of my friends have become... They have this universalist idea now. They want to travel the world walking around. So this is, this is the Palestinian youth. They're part of the rest of the international community. And this Project X is going to accumulate at one point, is going to be put together um, and get us to our national goal, ending the occupation and establishing a Palestinian state. But for that to happen, it needs to be part of a strategy. It cannot just happen on its own. And... Sorry to say that I believe until now we do not have a strategy. We have not had a strategy, and if we had one, it has miserably failed. And a lot of what we had is tactics. Tactic here and a tactic there, but never a defined goal uh, with a time frame that is going to get us to point X in this number of years. And I think it's time for us now to have that strategy. And there are a few things that I imagine should be in this, in this strategy, part of this strategy. One... Yes. One is development. Development which leads to opportunity. And this is local. You know, a lot, a lot of the speakers, um, which I would like to thank, talked about the international community and this, those, old, those big things. From a youth perspective, I want to talk about the small things. So, the local, those things also need to happen despite the occupation and in defiance of the occupation. So no one is going to stop us from developing local municipalities. We have tons of public policy experts. A lot of them are now graduating from universities going back to Palestine. Let's utilize those to produce quality services for the people, to create an ecosystem for those youth to get creative and to be able to, to do things in the future. One call actually on the business community here. The business community is the biggest, strongest, if not the only non-state actor in Palestine. I call on the business community to look back and to <coughs> pay, um, to, to stand before their social responsibility. Help the youth get somewhere. Be the ally of the youth. And one relevant thing that has to do also with diplomacy here is the Paris Protocol, which tells Palestinian chicken how many lays they can lay, how many eggs they can lay. This is crazy. Um, I think it's time for us to find some kind of a way uh, to break through the Paris Protocol. The second thing is a diplomatic strategy. A diplomatic strategy that is intertwined with those objectives that I talked about before. And that gets us to, like I said, a, a defined goal. Um, and I'll leave it for the diplomats to do that. And finally, there's this peace that we cannot avoid. Palestinians on their own cannot make peace. There needs to be another side that wants peace. And here I believe that the Israeli public is kidnapped by extremist right-wing government. And it's everybody's responsibility to free them from that kidnapping the situation. Those youth need to know in Israel that their government is leading them away from the solution and that the status quo that you know, the, the, the governments are, are trying to keep is not sustainable. We cannot fix the world. We cannot pretend to want to fix the world when our army kills um, nonviolent protesters. And also, the last point here is those youth in Israel need to realize that everybody, not only some people, are entitled to uh, self-determination and to life and to dignity. And with those things together, I believe that there could be a way forward for us. Whether it's a one-state solution, a two-state solution, um, 
it, it needs to be a solution of some kind. Thank you very much, uh, Abada. Um, now we'll proceed on to uh, Mr. Uh, Yossi Bellin, who is uh, currently the president and founder of uh, Baylink, a global consulting firm. Uh, he was uh, a former member of the Israeli Knesset and had a number of diplomatic posts, deputy foreign minister, deputy finance minister, minister of economy and planning, uh, and working in the office of the prime minister, uh, as well as Minister for Religious Affairs and Minister of Justice. So you basically uh, have done a number of, of uh, most important of which perhaps is that he headed the Israeli delegation to the multilateral peace working groups in 1992 to 95, which has also meant that he initiated the secret channel of talks that resulted in the 1993 Oslo Accords. So we have you to blame, perhaps, for some of this, anyway. Uh, so Mr. Benin will provide us with some reflections on the Oslo process and a vision for a solution of the conflict, taking into account the lessons learned. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here among you, and thank you all for uh, coming and for being interested in uh, the solution of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. Um, I just wanted uh, to uh, refer to something which was said yesterday, and it is not a direct answer to the question I'm asked, uh, by uh, Professor Hanan Ashrawi. Uh, Hanan, who is a very good friend of mine, said yesterday, uh, in his, her quite fair criticism against us that uh, Israel did not want to be part of the region, that's why she wanted, it wanted all the time to be part of European uh, sports leagues or the, in the UN of the West European and other governments, uh, WEOG. Now, this point is wrong. And uh, those who took uh, note of it should know that Israel in the 50s already tried its best to be part of the Asians, uh, Asian leagues, but there was no chance that they would uh, accept us as uh, part of their leagues. And eventually uh, we went to Europe and Europe was ready to uh, take us under its umbrella. Uh, the same goes for Weorg. Weorg was uh, created in the 60s uh, alongside with other regional uh, groups in the UN and, was the, and became the only vehicles to be elected to UN uh, positions. Uh, but uh, our geographical uh, region did not want us to be part of it. And as a result of it, after long negotiations with the Weorg, uh, and as you know, the others in WEOG are not less than the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they agreed to, uh, that Israel would be part of the WEOG uh, in 2000 as a result of the peace negotiations, uh, which do not take place anymore. Uh, so that is historic, uh, historical uh, uh, note. As to the question, my feeling is that the world, by and large, is sick and tired of us. The Palestinians have their right complaints, and the Israelis are, have their answers and their own right complaints, or wrong complaints, whatever you want. And people held us endlessly for so many years, <laughs> and I'm not sure that they are so much interested. I mean, the way that, that President uh, Trump said, one state, two states, whatever you say. You know, for us, this is our lives, one state or two states. And uh, the dismissal way, the dismissive way of reacting to, to these issues are, uh, for us, very, very problematic. I think that it is not by chance that the big earthquake of, of Oslo happened just as a result of secret talks between us and the Palestinians without anybody knowing about it. Anybody. 
Even our own prime minister did not know when it began. Because we were people who believed that we must have peace. First of all, because we are very selfish and we want ourselves and our kids to live in peace. And second, because we are human beings who want our neighbors to live in peace. That's the whole notion. Nothing is very complicated here. But, and, and this is why we could do these things. And then the, the peace between Israel and, and uh, Jordan, and in a way between Israel and, and Egypt, although eventually the involvement of President Carter was pivotal to finish it in the right, uh, in the right way. And there is another secret. Whatever we decide will be applauded by the world. The world is not interested in the details. Whether the border is here or there, whether the Jerusalem is an open city or, or a closed city, come to us with a solution. They applauded with Oslo because they thought then that it was the solution, the picture of Clinton and Arafat and, and Rabin, although it was just the interim of an interim. They applauded us when we came with the Geneva Initiative, the, the informal one. And they invited us everywhere because they believed this is the solution. So why not? I mean, they did not, never asked us. I can testify. What about this point with the electromagnetic space? Who, who was interested in, in details? Just come to us with a solution. What is the, the, the bottom line of this? If people on both sides who care who are ready to make peace. And understand that when you make peace, you are paying something. You are compromising on things that usually, at the beginning of the negotiations, you didn't believe that you would be ready to, to give up on. But as a result of the negotiations, you give up on things which are very important, and then you get it. And since we are human beings, both sides, apparently there is a solution. It is not written anywhere in the world that Israelis and Palestinians can never have agreement. In Oslo, there was an accumulation of, of some developments in Palestinian leadership, which was charismatic and strong, and Israeli uh, leadership, which was committed to peace and was ready for that and eventually paid with its life. And an American young president who wanted to prove something about his ability to change the world and was more than happy to get this paper and to invite both sides. This is the story of Oslo. I believe then, and I believe today, that the big mistake of Oslo was that we did not go directly to the permanent agreement then. But I can admit that both Rabin and some of the Palestinian leadership, with, with uh, which I, I talked about it, were very careful about not going there too quickly. The Palestinians were not ready, felt that they were not ready for that yet, that they had to build themselves as a proto-state before they are a state. And Rabin was afraid that if we fail with the permanent agreement, it would be difficult to go back and negotiate about the interim. While if, you go, if we go to the interim, it would be always possible to get back there. This was his, his view about it. Now, the current situation is very problematic for a permanent agreement. On the Israeli side, ideologically, it is a no-go. I don't see the government of Israel, regretfully, ready for a partition of the land. And that is the point. I mean, if there is no partition of the land, forget it. And on the Palestinian side, you see the, the, the rift between the Hamas and, and the PLO, uh, which makes it very, very difficult to get a solution, to get to a solution which uh, includes uh, both, uh, both sides. And uh, it makes it, I would say today, I don't want to say impossible because I, I don't accept it that it is impossible, but very, very difficult you will need other leaderships in order to go there. And it may be around the, the, the corner. It is not something for 20 years or 10 years or even five years uh, uh, from now. Now, speaking about a situation in which time will be ripe to go for it, I believe that we should go back to the main idea of the 
UN uh, General Assembly uh, Resolution 181. And the main idea of the partition resolution of the UN, which was, in my view, a very important, interesting, imaginative resolution, is that on the one hand, the land will be partitioned, but on the other hand, there will be a very high level of, of cooperation between the parties. My translation is a kind of a confederation. So that we will know, the Palestinians will know the, 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 the border, we will know the border. For the Palestinians, it will be a full self-determination as their own independent sovereign state. And, and Israel will be a uh, recognized, will have a recognized border after so many years in which it did, did not uh, have such a, a border in order to implement the idea of a Jewish state. I mean, the UN was not shy to refer to the idea of a Jewish state. And a Jewish state must be a democratic state. Otherwise, what did we do? And if it is a democratic, you cannot have a situation in which in the future, or almost now, a minority of Jews is dominating a, a majority of non-Jews, even if it is not apartheid, and if, even if there are rights, and even you, you don't have such a racial uh, laws or whatever, but it is inconceivable for us. We should not live in such a situation. We don't deserve it. And the Palestinians deserve their own state. So the, the only idea is, is a partition. And the question is not between one state and two states. There won't be a one state. No chance that there will be a one state solution. People like myself, as a Zionist, will fight against it until the end of my life. My parents did not come to, to, to this uh, place, to Palestine, in order to have another state which is not a, 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 Jewish, a Jewish state but it must be a democratic state. And without democracy, you cannot have a, the, the, the implementation of the Zionist dream. Now, a confederation between the two states means that we will decide about the framework of this idea. There is no confederation right now in the world. There are two states which are called confederations Switzerland and Canada, but they are not. They are federations. So it is open-ended. And I think that there are many things that are obvious uh, for, co for cooperation from planning and zoning of infrastructures, natural uh, resources, and things like that. It is such a tiny, small place that you must have cooperation. It is very artificial if it is just a partition according to the demography or whatever which doesn't take into account the, the natural uh, uh, situation. And there are also other uh, two or even three major points. One, the issue of the evacuation of the settlements from the <laughs> OK, so OK, the idea is that once we have a border, and the border will be on based on the 67 border with small uh, uh, changes, while Israel will have to compensate Palestine for, the, uh, for these changes. But to the east of this new border, there will be settlements. The main uh, nightmare of any prime minister in Israel not only from the right, is to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people. I can tell you it is more difficult than Jerusalem. It is more difficult than the issue of the refugees for the, the Israeli decision makers. If we want to overcome this, this uh, problem, it will be easier to do it in a, in, a situ in, in a framework of a confederation because then we can tell the, these people, next 
Thursday in the afternoon, Israel leaves the territory. There is a Palestinian state there. Those of you who want to stay there, fine. Those who want to, to leave will get compensation. If you want to live in Palestine, you are going to respect the Palestinian law. You will be a Palestinian resident and an Israeli uh, 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 citizen. On the other hand, parallel to it, you can say the same things to the Palestinians. You are Palestinian citizens, but you are invited to live in Israel as full residents, a permanent residents, which, will, which can solve in many ways, if you don't speak now about compensation and other things, uh, the, the issue of 194. And then there is the security issue. In the context of, of a, a confederation, it would be possible to have full coordination between the security forces of Israel and Palestine. I think that just to speak now about a demilitarization area in the West Bank is problematic because the ISIS of this world are, are searching for weak places which are not defended. If we, there is a confederation, then it will be possible to defend, to, to defend this area for the benefit of both countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry to have to cut you off, but to need, we need to provide the space for other thoughts and for our uh, audience to participate as well. So for uh, our last uh, presentation for the panel, uh, we'll hear the perspectives from uh, Ambassador Riyad Mandur, Man Mansour, who is the permanent observer of the State of Palestine to the UN, and we've have him, had him with us for the last two days. He previously also served as deputy permanent observer from 83 to 94, so he, is, he lives here in the UN. <laughs> um, uh, Ambassador Mansour, under his tenure is when the state of Palestine was declared and became uh, part, you know, a, 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 an observer, non-member state of the United Nations on 29 November 2012. So, uh, Ambassador, a vision for a solution, please. Thank you, Fatah. And also, I want to thank my colleagues who are in the podium for their uh, uh, presentations. I am delighted that we have, for the last two days, people who spoke from different uh, perspectives. Uh, I assume that all these perspectives are available to us to help us as Palestinians who are in the trenches, struggling for putting an end to occupation and the independence of our state to improve our work, to uh, add additional forces to our work so that we can, as this young man said, he wants time frame, so that within a limited period of time, we can reach the end line. I am happy that we have youth, we have civil society, we have many women, we have uh, ex-diplomats and officials, we have uh, legal uh, experts, we have all of you with us, and we are grateful for the committee of bringing all of you uh, to try to brainstorm of how we can advance the cause of justice for the Palestinian people and get them closer to the end line. Of course, it goes without saying that also we are very grateful to the division uh, which are the men and women who are working in the back, behind the scene, to make everything possible and to have these meetings as successful as we are uh, noticing. Now, for us, we are not starting from scratch, of course, nor can we afford, you know, to, uh, to engage in an abstract uh, theoretical exercise, although... We appreciate all those who are suggesting ideas to us, which we will examine them, we will, which we also will see what would fit in our uh, platform in a realistic way, and we will use that. And of course, 
what uh, does not fit, we will not tell anyone not to continue doing what they're doing. Uh, we will, uh, in fact, you know, last year and this year, we <clears throat> encouraged as many as possible from civil societies to come to speak in any way you want and to advocate all ideas, including PDS, what have you. The Israeli ambassador opened that Pandora box here at the UN, and I said to him, bring it on. He brings every year about 1,000 uh, Jewish American students to the UN to combat the BDS. He opened that door. And for me, I am welcoming anyone who wants to advocate such ideas or any other ideas that would be helpful to the struggle of the Palestinian people. This is an open place, and it is open for everyone, not only for one point of view, but for all point of views. And he has to blame no one except himself. He cannot come crying, saying, no, 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 you should not allow the Palestinians to come and talk about PDS when he started that process two years ago. It is a free place for anyone to advocate any idea they want. So what is our strategy or plans as we move forward? For us, the Palestinians, the most important thing is to put our house in order. We need to unify the two parts of the state of Palestine. It does not make sense, nor will it advance our cause to remain to be divided. Of course, to my good friend, Yussi Berin, you know, we were negotiating with the Israelis before the division, and now we are divided, and we are not negotiating with the Israelis. So the division, although it is hurting our national cause, but it is not the necessary condition for having you know, a successful outcome of this political process to end the Israeli occupation and to allow us you know, to enjoy independence. Our political platform as Palestinians, as we reflect it in our, the bodies that uh, represent us, uh, that represent all of us, uh, which is the Palestine Liberation Organization, I realize that our brothers in Hamas and in Jihad, they are not officially part of the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization. And I wish and I hope that they will join the Palestine Liberation Organization. We've accomplished something of a historical magnitude. After 1948, when our representation was fragmented and we did not control our cause as it was described, the Arab nations, the Arab countries, we're dealing with our uh, subject in the United Nations as a question of refugees, not through us, but through the Arab countries, mainly through the uh, host countries of the refugees. After 74 and after we succeeded in having the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, meaning we have an official body that speaks on behalf of the PLO, and within it, there are so many different political trends and even outside it, there are political trends, but we have a body that speaks on behalf of the Palestinian people. We are not going to go back to the stage when we don't have representation speaking on behalf of the Palestinians, nor we are a group of people. The refugees speaks for themselves. The youth speaks for themselves. The women speaks for themselves. All of them are components within our political body, which is the PLO, that speaks on behalf of all of us. In the last PNC, women fought so hard in order to guarantee 30% representation. Youth should be fighting very hard to have a quota representation within our political system. Now, that body that represents us has a platform. The platform, we need to end the occupation. And once we end the occupation, we want to have an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital on the 1967 borders. That is our political platform. We don't have reasons to start looking for a new political platform as Palestinians. If there is a strong trend among us to tell us to change our political platform, then we have to accommodate that uh, strong political trend among us. We have opinions, we have ideas, but the official political platform for the Palestinians, as reflected in the Palestine Liberation Organization, is to end the occupation 
and to have an independent state next to Israel. Now, for my friend, you know, UC Berlin, confederations do take place between independent states. If you find a magical way of ending the occupation and allowing us to have an independent state, and once we enjoy that control of our independent state, then we will have the luxury of deciding if we want to have confederation, whether with Israel, with Jordan, with anybody else, that would be uh, within the domain of the Palestinian people to decide on that. But you do not start from confederation before ending occupation. You have to end occupation first. Secondly, we have also a strategy and platform in the United Nations. In the United Nations, it was not an accident that we change our status to an observer state. It is congruent with what we did after the first intifada when we declared the independence of the state of Palestine in 1988. In 1988, after that, we wasted that opportunity. We made that declaration more or less a symbolic declaration without having teeth and legs. And after Oslo, that declaration of independence, to a certain extent, was lost. But later on, especially during the last seven, eight years, we started an, uh, a, a policy that we wanted countries to recognize the state of Palestine as an investment in peace and as an investment in saving the two-state solution. We succeeded in convincing 138 countries at the United Nations of more or less recognizing the state of Palestine and therefore changing the status to an observer state. That is historic because our situation, because of the complexity of it, and it is not a traditional case of the colonizers to withdraw from the land that they occupied and we enjoy independence. It is much more complicated than that. And as a result of this complication, we thought it's a creative idea to change our status to an observer state. That would allow us to do many things that we were not allowed to do. I refer to one case, which is joining the ICC. ICC. Another case is we joined all of the instruments of human rights uh, treaties and organizations related to the right of women, to the right of the child, to the, to the right of the disabled, and so on and so forth. It means that it allows us to become truly or to be accepted by the international community as a state because of the change of our status. That is not a small issue in the struggle for moving forward to end occupation and to enjoy independence. And even within that context, for example, next year, we don't expect much political developments to happen because, frankly speaking, until we know whether this current uh, administration would remain in the White House or a new administration to come, uh, not much will happen as a result of this current uh, you know, uh, uh, administration because it aligned itself very much with the position of Israel and therefore you know, it lost its role as the uh, broker of uh, the peace process. And that's why we are saying for us some time that we want a collective process to uh, deal with the political situation in the Middle East in the format of an international peace conference and so on and so forth. So therefore, next year, when the state of Palestine is elected to be the chair of the G77 and China, the largest collective body of 134 countries to negotiate about 70% of uh, the agenda of humanity, from climate change to eradication of poverty, to do all these to finance for development and so on and so forth. These are concrete uh, ways as part of a strategy in order to strengthen the pillar of the state of Palestine in the international arena as an added element to the steadfastness of our people in the ground. You add to that also this new uh, effort by tens of thousands of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and in other parts, uh, two, which in my opinion has two objectives. One, it is a serious effort to put an end to the illegal immoral blockade. And the other thing is to be a significant contribution 
to putting our house in order and to accomplish national unity. Therefore, I think the effort of, of, of every Friday by tens of thousands of Gaza should not remain in Gaza. It should spread to all part of the occupied Palestinian territory. It should spread among Palestinians inside Israel. It should spread also in the diaspora because we should not relive the isolation of Beit Sahur during the first intifada when they waged a remarkable you know, effort not to pay taxation, but they were isolated alone, or to leave the example of Bil'in, in which for six, seven years, they've been struggling to push the wall a few hundred uh, yards or meters away from their village. They should not, these remarkable incidents, should not be left isolated. The same thing with Jerusalem. 12 days outside the gates of Al-Aqsa Mosque, People of Jerusalem were alone, more or less. Or four or five days of closing the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they were also alone. We need to expand these events from being isolated in one location to spread to all parts of where the Palestinians are and even beyond to our friends in the international solidarity community to be also involved in supporting this event so that we can have much larger effect as we move forward. Uh, you know that there are many issues that we will deal with, you know, when we talk about, you know, uh, during the period of question and answers. But, you know, for us, we have a platform, we have a program. The title of it is Ending Occupation. Two-state solution is a derivative of ending occupation. And we will not be able to move in the path of equality with Israel and with Jews unless we have our own independent state completely separated from Israel, then a new environment will be created. Environment of accepting us as equal, not as subordinate living under occupation. And then once that environment is created, all the beautiful ideas that we heard yesterday and some of it today and from many of you will have the material base to flourish but without us being equal, living in our own independent state next to Israel, we will not be able to create a material base for all these beautiful ideas that we all share and we are we all eager to see coming into reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mansour. And my thanks to all the members of the panel for uh, some thought-provoking uh, ideas and, and some suggestions that have been kind of put forth that uh, may constitute part of our uh, of our discussion uh, thereafter. And I would, you know, perhaps we can elaborate more on some of those. Uh, I'm just going to summarize a couple of points that kind of uh, attract, caught my attention uh, in terms of the different presentations. Uh, Phyllis mentioned the uh, idea of. Uh, the importance, clearly, of civil society action and the possibility of maybe getting the General Assembly vote, uh, or the General Assembly to vote or to propose the idea of, in fact, uh, boycotting the Israeli arms industry in terms of, uh, you know, as a, as a possibility of, of uh, an added pressure and, and making it, as was mentioned uh, earlier in the last couple of days, uh, making the uh, occupation costly. Uh, to, to Israel. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, Obeda mentioned some, you know, you, you're relying on some development economics to try and create, begin to create solutions from the ground up at the more local level uh, in terms of the responsibility of the Palestinian business community and what can happen to begin to make change happen from the ground up as well as strengthening networking with Israeli civil society and in fact helping to liberate Israeli civil society from the ideological hegemony that is currently living under. Uh, so that's uh, another possible suggestion. Uh, Mr. Balin uh, added uh, an interesting vision of you know, a future confederacy and I guess what might be called a, an exchange of citizenship and permanent residence amongst the two population within that very limited uh, piece of land. If I can summarize that very roughly, in that way, 
And uh, then, of course, uh, Ambassador Mansour reminded us that uh, in the final analysis, we have a state, and that state has a political platform, and that political platform, the implementation of that, does depend entirely on the, uh, our ability to end, end the occupation, and, and how we can go about ending the occupation remains, uh, you know, a little bit uncertain. Certainly, you know, as Ambassador Mansour said, with the, uh, uh, you know, the coming together of all of these different efforts on the part of civil society, on the part of youth, on the part of the diplomatic community, and on the part of the United Nations uh, to make it happen, because that would certainly be the prerequisite for any sustainable peace. And if you cannot have peace when you have an occupation, for sure. Um, so, so with that, I'd like to open the floor to uh, discussion, questions, any other suggestions coming from the floor as well that we can add to, to some of these uh, ideas that can be taken up at a later uh, point. Uh, yes, you can also ask questions of one another. But let's take a couple of questions from the floor first because I'm sure people are anxious to participate in our discussion and then we can uh, kind of intersperse in between, yeah? Uh, please go ahead, Shawan. Uh, thank you, Fatah. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists for their presentations. Let me start first by showing you all my travel document, which called passport. There is nothing mentioned that Palestinian National Authority. No, it's Palestinian Authority. Not because the Palestinians, they want just to put authority without national. But the Israelis, and I think Mr. Bellin, during the negotiation, they emphasized and they refused completely to put a word called national. Why? Because they don't recognize us as a people, as a nation with rights, with national rights. This is an issue. I think it gives exactly the nature of Oslo and how Israel look at Oslo that they want to create a subcontractor at the occupied territory, but not as a national authority represent the Palestinians' rights, and mainly the rights that we are speaking about all the last two days. Another thing is, <clears throat> I know what it means, the permanent residence. It's not just a term. We feel it today that people live in Jerusalem, the Israelis, they define them as permanent residents. And today there is a policy of revocation of their residency. Thousands of Palestinians, they lost their IDs and they have no right to go back and to stay in Jerusalem in their property. This has happened and it has been happening every day. And here it means for me, if tomorrow, the residents in 48 area in Israel, maybe they will push them, Liberman, to go to West Bank, and they have no right to stay in Nazareth or Haifa, and Suhad Bshara, she has no any right, you know, to stay there. Because we have an example today. It's not a theoretical thing. No, what we are facing today, it's a policy. It's a practical policy. The other thing is, <clears throat> I would like to start with the settlers, you know, and uh, Mr. Balin, he feels that it's difficult, it's how to, you know, to send back hundreds of thousands, but there are Palestinian, millions of Palestinians. They were uprooted from, from their land. That's an issue. More than that, the settlers' presence there, it's illegal. It's illegal, and more than that, their presence there is a war crime. It's completely against the law of this building, of this house. How? How it comes, you know, that the illegal, we feel painful, but the legal, we don't be, we feel any painful. With millions of Palestinians, they are refugees. And more than that, three villages in Latron villages, you uprooted them, and they are staying in Ramallah and in Jordan as refugees, and they have no right to go back, you know, just 
a few meters away from Latrobe. That's, that's, you know, the issue I think I would like just to uh, address. But anyway, thank you for your presentations. Thank you very much. Let's take, um, please go ahead. My question is about the uh, ways forward towards peace in the region. And we were uh, witnessing so many complications, recent complications raised by the Israeli authorities towards the rest of the regional uh, powers or uh, issues uh, related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, such as the UNRWA issue, the refugees issue, the relationship with the Gulf, uh, which presented other further complications, especially to countries like Jordan, the custodian over the holy city, uh, sites in Palestine. All of these issues, we would like to hear some reflections or uh, guidance or any reflections from your side, thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's get a couple of uh, responses from the podium and then go back to you, yeah? Thank you for the comments and questions. Um, I would just point to a couple of issues about the nature of the Palestinian state that is, in fact, under and has been under discussion for 25 years or more. The state, well, if we look back at Resolution 181, we are here in the house that created 181. To begin with, it provided uh, the 55 percent of the land for 30, what was then 30 percent of the population and 45% of the land for what was then 70% of the population, the Palestinians. So to begin with, whatever one thinks about the idea, was it the right thing or whatever, just the way it was done did not reflect reality, let alone democracy, number one. If we look at the state that the international community that calls itself the United Nations, which sometimes those things get mixed up, which is which, the definition of the state that is actually on the table diplomatically is not a state because it does not control its own borders, it does not control its airspace, it does not control its waters, it does not control any of the things that make a state independent, and it would be forcibly disarmed. Yossi mentioned one way that it might not be, that there could be uh, a way that perhaps if there was a confederation, which of course, as we know, it comes later, um, there could be some way of protecting all sides. But in the meantime, what is actually being discussed is a state that is not only not contiguous, but does not have control of all the things that make a state a state, as opposed to an entity. So that the notion of Palestine, which for a long time was an observer entity here at the UN, I think we'd have to go back to that. We'd have to again start calling it a, a member entity rather than a member state because it would not have the control. I haven't heard anything from anyone who supports <coughs> the creation of two states, who supports dividing the current territory that exists under one controlling authority these days, which is the Israeli government and the Israeli military. I haven't heard anyone describe how to divide it in a way that gives equality between the two states, meaning that both have control of their borders, both can decide who enters, who exits, who doesn't at any time. Both control their own boundary waters. Both control their own airspace. That isn't on the agenda of the international community. It's not on the agenda of the United Nations. It certainly is not on the agenda of the United States. So I think that when we talk about the idea, we, we get caught up in this idea that the international community supports a two-state solution, and therefore that's all there is. The problem is what they're proposing is not a state. And it isn't all there is because it doesn't exist. What exists today is one state. And we have to figure out, for people who live there, not me, for others, what's the political arrangement? In the meantime, ending occupation has its own logic. 
And that's what we need to fight for. Equality has its own logic, and that's what we need to fight for, however many states there are at the end. I think maybe, Riyadh, I, I understand the, the primacy of fighting against occupation, and I absolutely agree with it, whether I would accept it because it's the Palestinian position anyway, but I also happen to agree with it. I don't think that that can only happen in the two-state context. I think we fight for an end to occupation as an end to a an illegality that exists today. And I think that's one of the ways we can look at it in a perhaps more creative way than starting with is it one state or two states. And I would add just one other point, which is that the General Assembly has in the past passed resolutions calling for an end to all dealings militarily with Israel. I don't necessarily think we should go back to those resolutions. They were problematic for other reasons. But there is a history of that. It's not like this has never happened before. Okay, thank you. Ambassador Mansour. Thank you. I, I don't want to get involved in a discussion with uh, my good friend uh, Phyllis. I just only want to say two things with regard to whether we are a state or as you propose entity. We are not an entity. We are a state and we are a state under occupation. We are not inventing that notion. You know as well as I do, when Germany invaded so many states in Europe, including France and Poland, these states, although they were under occupation, but they did not cease to be states. We are exactly like them. We are a state under occupation. And I don't think that you can have a stronger argument than the legal department of the United Nations when in the process of becoming a state, you submit your application, you sc you, they uh, scrutinize it, and they apply the Montevideo uh, description of states. And when they came to the conclusion that we are a state and passed our application to the Security Council for consideration, in the Security Council for ideological reasons, we do not have the resolutions to recommend us for admission as a state to the United Nations. However, the General Assembly, through the voting of 138 countries, they recognized us more or less, although it is not the business of the General Assembly to recognize us states, but they accepted us as a state, and therefore they changed our status to an observer state. So we are not an entity. We are a state, and we are a state living under occupation. This is for those who want thinking outside the box and creative thinking live with this new idea. We are not going to be born in a traditional way. We are born through C-section operation. That is our reality. And I think from our friends, of course from those, the Israelis and the US administration, that is their argument. They say that you are not a state, you are an entity, and they're refusing to accept us as a state. From our friends, we, uh, we hope that they do not buy that argument, accept the legal articulation that it is possible to be a state, but yet a state under occupation, and you are struggling for putting an end to that state. Let me just add one additional idea in anticipation before Susan Akram speaks. And also for you, you are suggesting for us a specific thing to do, which is to go to the General Assembly with a resolution asking states not to buy weapons from Israel. We take note of that. But I think that you should give us the discretion of how we navigate as to what is possible in the General Assembly. We made something remarkable for all of you. We opened the door ajar in Resolution 2334 in the Security Council, Operative Paragraph 5, when we legislated the differentiation in the dealings of everyone states, companies, organizations, to differentiate between Israel on the Green Line proper and the occupied territory. We are opening the door as much as possible and as much as the international community is ready to accept for dealing with the S idea that you want, at least acknowledge that we are assessing what is the international community is ready to do. For those of you who do not know, before we went to the ICJ in 2004 ruling, we had to go through two 
Security Council vetoes and Jabal Abu Ghnaim settlements in the late 90s, and we kept preparing the international community to the level of accepting to ask a question in the General Assembly to the ICJ. So while I appreciate your excitement, it's as easy as go and put a resolution to the General Assembly. I need to prepare the atmosphere in a realistic way where countries can be ready to support new creative ideas that we are going to propose. So let's work with each other to complement each other. I appreciate your telling us what you want to be done, but also be patient with us and give us the leeway of preparing the atmosphere for something that is realistic as we move forward. It is not too much to ask for from friends, <laughs> from those who are fighting together for advancing the cause of the Palestinian people. Thank you, Ambassador Mansour. And I, I think, uh, I don't think anybody was expecting that uh, upon the suggestion that you're going to jump tomorrow and, and go for the General Assembly uh, resolution. But it's, it's okay. I think, you know, we're, we're here at the level of ideas, you know, implementing those ideas and proposing them. No, of course, of course. <laughs> But you know, here we're talking at the level of ideas and suggestions, and you know, whichever gets us there will be useful. I just wanted to give the opportunity for Mr. Balin if you wanted to have some <laughs> thoughts in response at this point, or wait for some other comments, as you like. Thank you. Uh, first of all, about uh, the point that it is not a Palestinian national authority, but a Palestinian authority, you know, it's a very interesting and quite idiotic debate that we had. And uh, the idea of, the, of Rabin then was to keep the symbols of uh, nationalism to the state. Now, you know, we had a date. The date was May the 4th, 99. And we, we uh, hoped and worked for that, uh, that there will be a permanent agreement. And uh, everybody knew, although it is not part of the Oslo agreement, that uh, it will be uh, with a Palestinian uh, state. Rabin, in a way, was afraid that if you give something like symbolic uh, uh, words or acts in advance, you are taking something from the permanent solution, which is a Palestinian state. Now, what is the paradox of history? And, now, and, and you remember that we had this really stupid debate about how should we call the head of the Palestinian whatever. And the Palestinians said, president. And the Israeli side uh, said, chairman. And the solution was, Raiz. Because... I mean, so if you read the, not the Oslo Agreement, but the interim one, you see R A, -A apostrophe I S. So the, the, in English and in Hebrew, it appears in the Arabic world, which is both president and chairman. Came Sharon and said, Shu Bitcom, what do you want? The Palestinians already have a state. 40% of the land is theirs. What do you want from them? Now, what they don't, they, they want, they want to be called president? President, immediately. You are president. Prime minister, you are prime minister. There was no, not anymore any council, executive council. There was a government. And he treated the Palestinian side in a very patronizing way, actually saying, you don't need any more, anything more. So I don't believe that the, the fact that Rabin was a little bit uh, stingy with symbols was the problem. The problem was with the generous people who were ready to give all the symbols provided they don't give the land. So this is, you know, just historical uh, uh, note. Um, about uh, what uh, the ambassador said on a confederation that cannot be from day one, but 
once the, there is a Palestinian state, there is no difference between us. I don't suggest that this will be a precondition or that it will be from day one, but why is it important to, to uh, talk about it now? Because it is different kind of negotiations. If the target is to go towards confederation or the, the target is to say what some of our good people said, we are here, they are there. We don't want to see you. We want to have a wall, and that's it. I don't have, want to have a wall. I don't want to cooperate. I, I believe that we, are, we know each other much better than we know others, and that we can, we can cooperate in many, many uh, ways, and there is no shame of having a confederation. Once one of the sides will decide to uh, tear it off, it will be enough. I mean, you don't need, a, you, you, neither of us will have a veto power to keep the confederation. It's enough. Like in a proper divorce, that one side doesn't want to keep it, that uh, this confederation will fade away. Now, uh, about the issue of uh, permanent residence, you know, you don't have to argue with me the, about the settlers. You, you know me and you know that from day one, I was against any stone built in the, in the West Bank. So this is not the, the case. The, the case is that you have them there. And the case is that whoever is the prime minister of Israel, it will be frightening for him or for her to take them back. I believe that if they have a choice, most of them will leave. But there will be those who will say, no, we prefer to live uh, in Palestine because it is uh, the cradle of, of our history. And I think that this arrangement with permanent uh, 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 residents and, and uh, with citizens is something which is doable. We will have to agree that the permanent residents will not be people without a status and that eventually it would not be possible either for Israel or for Palestine to tell the permanent uh, residents from one day to another, you don't have any rights. This is something that we can work on. Yes, we, we found solutions for many other things, some of them successful, some of them uh, less. And uh, to, to uh, Phyllis, I want to say two things. First of all, the end of occupation will not only be uh, happened as a, a result of a one state or two states. There is also a third way. And regretfully, this third way is the only one which was tried. And that is Israeli uni unilateral uh, uh, withdrawal without the agreement of anybody. And I, I can tell you something which is not simple. I was very much against the, the withdrawal from Gaza, very much against it. You argue with me. Please don't, you, you know, if you don't know me, please Google me. I, I, I don't deserve it. I, 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 I understand what you say to me, okay? The withdrawal from Gaza was something very problematic because in Oslo we agreed that Gaza and the West Bank are one unit politically. And because we did it unilaterally. There was a Palestinian leadership. There was even a new leader. And there was no reason in the world not to do it in the context of an agreement with him. For, I was there ahead of, then the head of a party. My party didn't like my view about it because they said if, if Israel is withdrawing, if Sharon is withdrawing, you are the one who is telling them don't, don't do that. And then I talked to my Palestinian uh, friends. And they said, well, it is very uh, problematic. It is a problematic surprise for us. But we cannot say to an Israeli leader, don't withdraw from Gaza. And you know, I cannot be more Palestinian than the Palestinians. If they say, okay, withdraw unilaterally, Leave it to say, no, 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 stay in Gaza. Nobody will understand it. How come a Davish leader, the most Davish leader, Zionist leader, 
is telling the prime minister, don't, uh, don't withdraw. And then we supported it so much so that my party was the party which actually enabled Sharon to withdraw. We gave him the majority for his coalition. Now, a rightist government in Israel, under internal pressure of having a Jewish and democratic state, and it will not be democratic anymore if it is a, a Jewish state with a minority leading a majority of non-Jews, will do that. He or she will withdraw, and we know exactly where to. To the border, to the fence, to the wall which was built by Sharon. And I, I'm afraid that this is a non-solution. And again, it will not be really free of occupation because somehow Israel will be in charge of the sky or whatever, as it happens in Gaza. And this is what I'm, I'm worried about. It is not only a, an agreed upon withdrawal or a continuation of the current situation. It is a unilateral withdrawal, and there are signs that there are thoughts about it in the Israeli right. Let's leave it at that, uh, Mr. Balin, and continue with our... I think we have uh, Suhad and, and uh, Etai, and I think also Susan. So let's take those three for now, and then uh, go to the next round. Thank you. Suhad, please. Um, my, um, my question will be addressing... Um, uh, Mr. Balin, um, thank you all for the interesting um, interventions. Uh, Mr. Balin, I'm a citizen of Israel, I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, and I've been practicing human rights law within the Israeli legal system for the past 20 years or so. And uh, the Israeli system in its, in its three branches, legislative, governmental, executive, and the judicial, has proven constantly uh, in a systematic way to be a systematic violator of human rights, which is ideologically driven, based on the definition of the state as a Jewish state. It's a very long list. I won't go over uh, all of it, but it includes displacement, until nowadays in the Naqab, which is ideologically driven. Jewadization of areas. This is why the displacement is taking place. Ban on family unification. Limitations on commemorating the Nakba, which is the, basically the reason why we are all here. No return of the internally displaced. Segregation in residential areas. Arbitrary confiscations of lands limitations on freedom of expression, revocation of citizenship, and the lethal force against demonstrator, demonstrators, which resulted in the killing on, of 13 citizens in 2000. Up until now, no police officer that was responsible for the shooting and killing of the 13 was held responsible. How would you reply to me in a Jewish state with these practices that, again, are ideologically driven as a result of the definition of the state, how do you grant me, according to your solution, full equality in a normal democratic state? Okay, thank you. Um, Itai, please go ahead. Thank you, and I, and I feel privileged to follow Suhad and proceed, uh, Susan. Uh, let, let me offer two ob observations. Uh, one, in relation to the legislative um, effect of 2334. OP5, OP11, um, they're not an exercise in, in innovation in international law. They simply restate what is well established. Um, look no further than the commentary on, on Common Oracle 1 of the Geneva Conventions, the ILC articles on state responsibility, they provide an extensive menu of measures of retortion, lawful countermeasures, the disposal of states in this room should they wish to bring Israel into compliance with international law. That brings me to the Oslo scorecard. In the negative column, uh, is the inherent flaw 
which is concluding an agreement between the ousted sovereign and the occupying power. There is a prohibition on such agreements in, in the sense that they would, uh, or when they deprive the civilian population of the protection that is enshrined in the conventions. We have to be careful looking to any kind of future uh, framework that not to um, allow that to take place. So my question to the panel would be, if we are to envisage uh, yet another framework for Middle East peace, how, could, how would states uh, support a resolution to the conflict, keeping in mind that they would have to counterbalance both Israeli evasion and I'm afraid that the internal domestic politics of Israel have changed dramatically uh, over the course of the last 25 years, but also counterbalance U.S. unilateral propositions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one more, and then we'll proceed to, to a couple of our state representatives, please. Uh, Susan, please go ahead. Hello. Okay. Um, Mr. Ambassador, all the points humbly understood, well taken, and I wait until our next rally, but I'll take a pass this round. Uh, I have a question and a suggestion for Mr. Balin. Uh, the question is, um, or request, is for a citation, a string citation, if you could provide one, uh, for the support for the claim that the UN authorized a Jewish state, um, at, starting with primary law and then secondary law, please, because in years of research, I have not find, found such support. Uh, and that support is not found in Resolution 181, which brings me to my suggestion, which is perhaps a rereading of 181 might be helpful. Um, you uh, referred to the economic provisions, but you failed to mention that the core of 181 were the requirements of UN supervision of both states uh, until such time as a constitution was drafted uh, for each state, even though one state was called an Arab state and the other a Jewish state. In fact, those provisions negate the idea of a Jewish state because the two constitutions were to be, the core of the constitutions were to provide equal rights in both states for all of the population in each one and protection of minorities, but it was not until those constitutions were drafted and approved by the United Nations was there to be implementation of 181. Uh, so um, my suggestion is that not since 181, nor even today, uh, will one find support for the contention that the United Nations has ever authorized or legitimized the notion of a Jewish state. Thank you. If I may now quickly. Yeah, yeah. If uh, I have to give the floor quickly to two brief comments, please, of the representatives of Turkey first and then the representative of Ecuador and then we'll go back to the panel for a round of responses. But please try and be as brief as possible because we don't have a lot of time. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for this great panel. I have a, uh, just a few comments and questions to Mr. Balin. Uh, first, uh, in the elections in the early 90s, your merits group got 17 seats in the Canadian. Excuse me, are you a representative or, or, of Turkey? No, no, no I no. am not. Then My uh, name why are you sitting at the... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm no. Uh, Go ahead, finish yeah. your comment very no, briefly. My name is Abdul please. Hamid Sayam, and I'm an accredited journalist and a professor at Rutgers University. Okay. Thank you. You have two minutes, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're, uh, you had 17 seats in the Knesset. Now the uh, Peace Now movement is almost ne uh, next to nil. The, don't you see that the whole Israeli society is going toward the right and becoming more as 
Hanin Zorbe said, moving from a racist society to a fascist society. The second, you said your parents came from Europe not to live except in a, like a dominantly Jewish state. Isn't that racist in the nature? Why it has to be Jewish state? And when your parents came to Palestine, why they have to take the place of those Palestinians who were expelled out of their homeland? Thank you. Okay, thank you. May I please now um, ask the representative of Ecuador to, she's here. She's where? Ah, there you are. Okay, uh, thank Gracias, you again very briefly, please. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, for giving me the floor. I'd like to bid welcome to the sound engineers, the interpreters, and everybody who's making this uh, successful event possible. I'd like to pay a tribute also to the committee. This forum is invaluable. It's made it possible for us to put a lot of ideas out on the table. We've heard a lot of good ideas, which will certainly make it possible for us to evaluate, judge steps that have already been taken in the framework of the United Nations, to identify what kind of progress we're making and make corrections when necessary, especially in the consensus and with our desire to solve problems that will last to deal with a problem that's been going on for more than 70 years. I'd like to express the solidarity of our people. Always, we're with the Palestinian people, as we always have been, with the Palestinian cause. The videos and the statements unquestionably deserve appreciation, and they've, they've, uh, un they're unforgettable. I'd just like to say the Bible says that uh, there's a Traveling to the mountains yields a great deal. I think we know that the cause of the settlement, the solution, is self-determination of the Palestinian people. These are just a few brief comments that I wanted to make before making, before, uh, making a question. I think that Palestine should, have the ne should be the next president of the group of 77 plus China. That's an important group in this organization, and I'd like to express our full support for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, the representative from Malta, please go ahead for brief comments. Yes, um, thank you for giving me the floor. I would like to focus on uh, this afternoon's um, subject, on forward-looking rather than backward-looking. So um, uh, with that in mind, I must say that there are some commonalities. There is hope uh, in what I've heard. And I think that there is an undeniable agreement that the status quo is not tenable on both sides, both on the Palestinian side and also on the Israeli side. I think, as Mr. Berlin said, people are sick and tired of us. I think that the Jewish state is in total conflict with a democratic state. You can either have a democratic state, but with the demography, you cannot have a Jewish state while keeping demography. One important point that I think people should realize, and hopefully both the Israelis and Palestinians are realizing, as well as we as member states, is that you can never have perfect peace, but you can very well have a perfect war. So with that in mind, as well, I think referring to what Mr. Balin said, a one state solution can never happen, but also neither a confederate country, in my view, can never happen. Why? Because this vicious circle of violence, of excessive use of force, of victimization, is leading to more hatred, to more intolerance, to more mistrust between the parties, and eventually all these years have produced two mutually exclusive people that they can never, we can never hope that they live together in peace, and insecurity in one state. This leads me to 
a measure of hope. You tell me that I'm zigzagging, I'm, you know, but I'm thinking out of the box. It leaves me with a measure of hope because, yes, maybe there can be a confederation, but not a confederation of a country. Maybe there can be an experiment with provisos, clear provisos, of, of a confederation of a city, the international city of Jerusalem, under the authority, not of Israel, not of Palestine, of the United Nations, with a provision and condition that the Palestinians who used to live there, they have a right to return, that there will be right for compensation wherever there is a right of compensation, and there will be a special status for the international city of Jerusalem, instead of continuing decades and decades of fighting who will take over Jerusalem, everybody has arguments. I have my own opinion. You have your opinion. Everybody here has his own opinion. We cannot reach agreement. We cannot have both parties have Jerusalem. So let's have none of them have Jerusalem. And then it will be there will be a right of access, both for Israelis and Palestine, monitored under peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping missions. I think that will give us an experiment. It will be coupled with the issue of resettlement, solution for resettlement bit by bit, and which will hopefully be a confidence building a measure towards a comprehensive peace solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. Uh, now, if we can go back to the panel for some responses, and I would beg members of the panel uh, to work against your best instincts and limit your, your uh, responses to about two or three minutes just to kind of deal with the very specific questions. Let's start with uh, uh, Badiaya. Yeah. So I don't have a specific um, answer for any of the questions, but I would like to give an observation. Um, I'm not representing the youth, but uh, since I'm speaking, you know, on the issue of the youth, I like to, I want to think like a, like a youth. And over the past two days, I want to say I've, I've seen two things. I've, se I've seen a realm of real politique, which is not strategic enough from my perspective. We need it to be much uh, more powerful, much more strategic, and much, wo much more um, focused on a well-defined goal. But then there's this other realm of great ideas, which are from my humble perspective, opinion, utopic. And for me as a Palestinian who was born and raised there, I would like to see, I would love the help of the international community, of the international lawyers, of international politicians in making um, an amalgam of those two. So real politics, something that works in the real world, but that is also creative. So maybe it's gonna be, um, Coming like th th this, I don't want to give up Jerusalem, but that that got out of the box a little bit. Thank you, Ambassador Mansour. It is not out of the box because uh, it is the position of the international community when they advocated the partition plan. Jerusalem was given a special status under international administration. Of course, now 70 years later, you want to implement it. You know, this is something that you are advocating. Uh, it is as difficult as also other issues, but it is the position of the international community as reflected by resolution 181. Now, with regard to Oslo, uh, let me just say the following one. I believe that Oslo was uh, uh, killed First, with the assassination of Rabin, then the killing of Yasser Arafat after him. And for those of you who want announcement, we decided in our last session of our Palestine National Council and the Central Council before it, a few months ago, that Oslo has expired. Netanyahu spent all of his life fighting against Oslo, so therefore there is not much sense in continuing you know, the discussion over something that has been declared dead 
by both parties. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, Mr. Yussi Bellin, you know, might uh, have uh, some sentimental feelings about uh, the death of some a baby that he was involved in nourishing it. But uh, I think that he agrees with the assessment that uh, both parties are declaring that the Oslo is, uh, period is behind us. For me personally, for some of you who do not know, I resigned my post in protestation to Oslo in 1993-1994. When I came back after 11 years when all those who opposed Oslo said that the new realities have been created and they were involved with the new reality and I was asked and lobbied heavily by some of my friends to go back to be involved in the new realities, and that's why I came back for my post. But that is only for those who do not know, but that is part of uh, my history. Uh, the other thing is with regard to per uh, Resolution 181. Also in the Resolution 181 was unique in so many different ways. It had not only advocating the partition of Palestine to three pieces, two states and uh, international administration for Jerusalem, but also it gave borders, maps, and it gave population of each state. <coughs> it is very ironic that the, the state that was called the Jewish state, the population of that state was almost 50-50 Jews and Palestinian Arabs. In fact, the difference was only 10,000 uh, inhabitants between, I think, roughly 390,000 to 380,000. And in the Palestinian state, there was only 10,000 Jews among more than 700,000 Palestinian Arabs. So these are the facts of the United Nations in terms of its composition. I suppose for you know the Zionist movement at that time, they wanted a state. And they were happy that for uh, for for not having what to call it, they call it a Jewish state in the partition plan, uh, because what else could they call it? And even, you know, when it declared itself, it declared itself as the state of Israel. It did not declare itself as the Jewish state of Israel or as the Jewish state itself. And you know the story with President Truman, when they put a piece of paper for him for the recognition, the Jewish state of Israel, he scratched the Jewish and he left it uh, only as the state of Israel. This is only just to set uh, the record uh, straight. Now, what do they want to call themselves in Israel? That is their business, not our business. But it is our business to care for equality, national equality, for our brothers and sisters who are carrying the Israeli passports and citizenship. They are struggling for national equality. They are not struggling for civil and religious rights as it was advocated in the Belfort Declaration. They are struggling for national equality. They are national uh, group living in their own national homeland. It is true that they are minority in Israel because the majority are Jews, but they are struggling for equality, for a state to have equality among all of its citizens, and they are fighting for their national rights. And uh, we, believe that that struggle is part of the struggle of all Palestinians everywhere as the struggle of those who live in the diaspora as refugees struggling for exercising their right to return uh, in accordance with Resolution 194. So for those who think that, you know, we are fixated on only on one component of our people, we're not. But we don't tell the Palestinian Israelis of how to conduct their struggle because they are much more sophisticated than anyone to tell them how to conduct the struggle, but it is our duty to support their struggle completely as it is their duty to, to support the struggle of those who live under occupation completely to put an end to occupation and as they and we do support the people who live in exile as refugees to exercise their right of, of uh, to return. And I don't think that it serves our cause in any uh, good to try to compartmentalize in, in, in a sense that I want, only want to focus on the right of the refugees. No, you focus on the national 
legitimate rights of the Palestinian people, all the rights of all the components everywhere as one package, because this is our national political platform and we don't dissect it, although we have maybe different you know, tasks in terms of the struggle of how we can advance all these components. This is what I wanted to share. And right. let me just say one last thing. You know, I disagree a lot with many things of my friend UC Berlin said. But UC Berlin is not the major, you know, enemy of this uh, <laughs> gathering here. He is one of the brave ones who might have, you know, we might disagree with him in many ideas, and I do. And those who raised issues, they disagreed with him. But he is not, you know, the, the, the enemy to, to say that, uh, you know, to, to try, you know, to, uh, to put all of your uh, strong feelings against him because you are putting him at, at the wrong target. The strong feeling that should be put under those, and by the way, the fascist Abdel Hamid that you said, Israeli leaders characterize what is happening there as a form of fascism, and I don't know what is the position of uh, UC Berlin. He might be in the same camp of those who characterize these trends inside Israel as being forms of uh, exhibiting forms of fascism inside uh, Israel. But, you know, again, you know, as well as I do, you know Shawan, you know Abdel Hamid and others, that UC Berlin is what he is, what he is, but he is not the target for causing the problems for the struggle of the Palestinian people. And I believe he should be treated as a courageous man being with us. He has his own view and he is open for discussing these views and disagreeing with him. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mansour. Phyllis, would you like to add a few things? Just briefly on two points. One, just to clarify what I s spoke about earlier, Mr. Ambassador, to make clear, Palestine today is a state under occupation. You're absolutely right. I never challenged that. What I said, or what I, perhaps I missed a word, what I meant to say was that if the nature of a Palestinian state, which is now under discussion in the international community broadly, based on the everyone knows theory, everyone knows that Palestine would be disarmed, everyone knows it would not have control of its borders, everyone knows that it would be based on the 67 borders with swaps, it's always said as one word, 67 borders with swaps, the swaps are never identified. But if that were to become the basis of a two-state solution when it was no longer considered occupied, in my view, then it would be an entity short of a state. That was my point. That but but the, that, is, that is not what you're talking about. You're saying okay. now it's uh, under occupation. I understand that, and I absolutely agree. Of right. But my concern, why, because I was talking about the question of the discourse and how the discourse has changed. One way in which the discourse has not changed is on the question of what would a Palestinian state, a two-state solution look like. Everyone knows it would be disarmed, it would not have control of its borders, its airspace, its waters, et cetera. And when we fight back and say, no, not everyone knows that. Palestinians don't know that. Palestinians have a different view of what it would look like. It, that has not changed in the discourse in the United States, in the media, and I'm afraid in the United Nations to a large degree. It has not been a challenge. So that was my only point, was distinguishing if then, what would it look like? Judge my, us then, not in advance. Okay, okay. well, I'm, it's not judging you at all. No, judging the Palestinians uh, who are advocating statehood. Okay, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. I'm just looking at what is un, on debate and what is under debate and what is not. And the discourse has changed in an extraordinary way. But on that question, Unfortunately, in my view, it has not changed, and it should. I do think that one thing has changed, and here I would disagree with you, Yossi, on this notion that people are sick of the conflict. What I see, I spend a lot of time on the road in the United States. I'm on college campuses a lot. There is more interest than ever before, not in Israel, in Palestinian rights. That's now the debate that is underway, is how to support Palestinian rights. The change within the Jewish community in the United States, where there is, for the first time, what, what never existed when I was growing up as a young Jew, as a young Zionist, we had, if you were Jewish, you were a Zionist. That's sort of all there was. Those were the organizations you joined. That's all there was. 
all of a sudden, like every other community, there's a right, a left, and a center. You have APAC and its minions on the right. They have a lot of money. The right wing often has more money than others. That's true here as well. You have J Street in the center. You have Jewish Voice for Peace on the left, growing the fastest of all of them. And it's because young people, not only Jews, but it's opened up a debate in a whole new way so that young people on campuses are talking about Palestinian rights. They're not talking about the conflict. How do we solve the conflict? We're talking about rights. And that's why it's being linked to other movements. How is the question of US military aid to Israel con connected to the question of police violence against black and brown communities in the United States? This is the basis of new collaborations, new ways of thinking about things. It's creative, it's young. Some of it is like you look at it and say, what, what are they thinking? But it's because people are thinking about things in a whole different way. And it's exciting as could be. Now, if you look at any one campaign, is it necessarily going to, to succeed? We don't know yet. Some of them probably are going to fall away. Some will succeed. The BDS movement has transformed how people think about what their personal responsibility is for US foreign policy. It's given people a way to act as an individual. When we say, think globally, act locally, BDS gives people a way to do that. Whether it's boycotting Sabra Hummus or, or organizing a campaign to, di to divest from Caterpillar bulldozers. There's all kinds of options. The churches are taking it up in a whole new way. So I think the notion that people are sick of it, it's just not what I'm seeing across the United States. And I think that this is what we hear civil society certainly, but also diplomats, other countries. The, these movements have ties with other countries. Um, you know, the people that are facing US military equipment in their own communities are also the ones that are facing the consequences of the collaboration between US local police and the IDF and border police in Israel, where the ADL is arranging trainings for US local police officials to be trained in Israel. This is giving rise to all kinds of new ways to think about Palestinian rights. And it's a very exciting time. I think Palestinian activists are, are seeing that. Activists for Palestinian rights are seeing it. It's an amazing time and it's coming from the youth. It's coming from young people. The energy, the new ideas. So I'm very optimistic on that level. I think we're seeing already shifts in the discourse, except for on the one way that I said. Mm -hmm. But this is an amazing time to be working on this issue because it's right. the one arena in international stuff where we're seeing real victories in, in changing public opinion and the media. Not quite yet Congress, but we'll get there. Thank you for this, thank you. I agree with you. Yossi, <laughs> would you like to, to address yourself to some of the thoughts that have been presented? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your nice words. Um, about uh, Oslo, I have no nostalgia for Oslo. Oslo was mainly, for me, the recognition between Israel and the PLO. And uh, the material itself, it was a, 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 an interim solution. I mean, the, the, the the content of, of Oslo is not revolutionary. The re if there was something revolutionary, it was the, the mutual recognition. But the point for me, they are always asking me whether Oslo is dead. The problem is that it is not dead. The problem is that so many people are criticizing Oslo from right and from left, from the Israeli side and from the Palestinian side. But at the, bot at the bottom line, you have a a, an Israeli rightist government which actually holds Oslo, keeps Oslo. It is the, the guardian of the, of the Oslo agreement because it is so convenient. And you have a Palestinian leadership which rather than saying thank you very much, the Palestinian Authority is the only uh, legitimate daughter of Oslo. We give up on this beautiful gift take the keys, pay for our budget, guard us, do all the, the, the services, do all the, the, the things that you have to do for us as occupied under you, and salute. Rather than that, I mean, between us, 
tell nobody. <laughs> it's quite convenient to have a president and a prime minister and ministers and uh, bureaucracy. It's not so bad. And people are used to it. And they continue to complain. And everybody is coming to me. You invented Oslo. We hate Oslo. Be my guest. Who needs Oslo? The worst thing which happened to Oslo is that it is still around. It had to be a five-year agreement under the 4th of May, I say again, 99. It is almost 20 years and we keep it. All those who speak against Oslo keep it like a treasure. <laughs> so this is, this is about Oslo. Uh, then I surprise you too. <laughs> okay, please surprise me. I, I talked about it with Abu Mazen, I wrote about it, I published, I got such support for it. And everybody is telling me, we should think about it seriously. You are right, there you have a point. <laughs> uh, about the equality in Israel, regretfully, even if uh, there is a, a legal equality and even that is not full, uh, there is no, no uh, real equality. I can easily say that there is never full equality. You have here black people, you have here Jews you who complain, or there were Jews who complained 50, 60 years ago who were prevented from participating in clubs and whatever, and that's why they created their own organizations. But this is not a good enough reason. The answer is that we have to fight. Jews and Arabs in Israel have to fight for Arab equality, full equality. The fact that you have in every hospital in, in, in Israel uh, Arab doctors, in every university you have Arab uh, lecturers is not enough. You had an, an Arab minister, you have an Arab Supreme Court member. This did not happen in the past. It is a a, a, a result of the development in the years, but this development is too slow. I tried to do my best in my time. It was never enough, and it is not enough today. But I believe that the, the tendency is right. I mean, more and more people understand the importance of e equality in Israel. I'm speaking now only about Israel because this is the only thing that you, uh, that you raised. And we have to continue and fight to get, uh, 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 for it, and we have to do it together. It's not, it shouldn't be only the fight of Arabs. It should be a joint fight of Arabs and uh, Jews. Um, about the, the issue of, uh, of merits and the left, the left the merits was 12, by the way, at its height. Uh, it was a, 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 a unity of three different parties. One of the parties left, and it became smaller. The left, the, the center left of Israel is about forty percent. The center, the, the right, the center right in Israel is about forty percent. The right can never win without the ultra orthodox. Orthodox. The left can never win without the Arab minority. That is the Israeli picture, and we are all more or less even for many, many years. The, the center left is not doomed, it is there. And uh, I, I really hope that it will change quite soon. We have elections in, in uh, the end of uh, 19, and my hope that uh, it will change for the, for the better. And in order for, for it to change, we need to work a lot. Uh, about uh, the 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 issue of hatred between Jews and Palestinians, Israelis and Palestinians, it doesn't prevail, uh, prevent a, a confederation between two states. It is not in one state. I want just to re-clarify. And I think that you have love-hate relations. The, the, co the, the connections between Israelis and Palestinians are far deeper than the connections between the Israelis and Egyptians or with Jordanians. We know each other for years. We visit each other. Many of us have friends on the other side. Uh, we, many of us uh, speak Arabic and many, many more uh, Palestinians uh, speak Hebrew. So I, I see, and I always look at the, at the history of France and Germany. In one day, they became under the same uh, roof. 
of the, the European community. So we have to take into consideration that, that enemies of yesterday can be uh, can uh, cooperate and, and uh, be together. Of course, it cannot be imposed on them. It is only if they wish so they can uh, do that. And, uh, and Ambassador Mansour already told you about uh, Jerusalem. I mean, uh, this was the, the, the 181 uh, uh, resolution. Israel or the Israelis for, to, to become uh, agreed to it. <coughs> were not happy about it, but agreed to it. Uh, the Palestinians and the Arabs were very much against the whole resolution, including this part of the resolution. And uh, it's quite uh, difficult to make eggs out of a uh, scramble egg. Uh, this is not my idea. This was always something that uh, Shimon Peres used to say. You know, you go one way and you have Jerusalem as your capital and the Palestinians wants to see El Quds as their capital and they deserve it. And now to tell them, forget about it, it will be too late. And the, the last point that I wanted uh, to raise about whether uh, Israel is not a Jewish state uh, because uh, it, is, it doesn't have a constitution, I regret the fact that in October 48 against the, the 181 resolution, as you, rem as you mentioned, and against the... the Israeli de Declaration of Independence of May. Uh, we still don't have a, 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 a constitution. But for me, Israel is the state of the Jewish people and of all its citizens. This is the platform of my party. This is my belief. There is no, no uh, contradiction between these two parts I don't want to give you the lecture of why I believe that my people deserves to, to have its own uh, state. The international community accepted this idea. And, you know, I suggest to all those who believe in the Palestinian right to have freedom and independence and equal rights, not to suggest to us now to forget about the Jewish state. It will not help. You, will, you have in Israel many people who understand that we are doomed if our neighbors are doomed. We believe in this friendship because we are selfish. And they believe in this cooperation, many of them who believe in this cooperation, because they are selfish too. And they know that working with Israel is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. So, so when, when somebody is, is coming to us and tells us, you know, when now we are working on the idea of a Palestinian state and about, about Palestinian rights, by the way, you, you don't have these rights. And actually, there is no Jewish state. And the UN never thought about a Jewish state or something like that. I'm telling you. These scholastic ideas, which may be or may be not right when you try to prove it in some kind of a court, are not in place. It will not help the Palestinian cause. And if you believe in the Palestinian cause, I suggest not to raise them. Thank you. Um, we have less than 20 minutes left. I've got a list, and we're not going to be able to get to everybody, so if you've come in a bit late, we'll have to go over. I think I have uh, you here waiting for quite some time to speak. So let's start with you, and I'm going to check my list to see how much we can do before we have to close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zina Agra. I'm the US Policy Fellow for Shebeka based in New York. Um, I have a couple of comments um, and which lead into a question. Um, First, I'd begin by saying I think that this morning's panel was actually really the discussion of the future here because they brought in the question of refugees, they brought in the question of reparations, and I find that this conversation, for better or worse, has actually lapsed into conversations that have been repeated many, many times, both at this conference but also uh, in, the, in this chamber. The second uh, quick point I want to make is that I, I'm, wa I'm wary with the use of the word peace that I've heard deployed again and again. It, it hasn't been defined. Um, it hasn't been given any form of definitive meaning. And from my sense in terms of the context that it's been used is that it's put in a set, it's, uh, it seemed to imply quiet or, or silencing. And actually, peace doesn't equal that. Peace equals justice and it equals... Um, 
it equals equality. And I think when we talk about peace, that is in that context that we should be deploying it and we should deploy it with a lot more caution than we have been on this panel. And the third remark, very quickly, is that um, similarly, the, the term youth hasn't been de uh, defined here. Youths are a demographic contingent. They're not a political voting block with a political leanings. Um, the only difference between young people and the generations that came before them is that they have to live with the, de the decisions of the world longer than the generations that came before them. Um, and I think we need to be very wary when we deploy the term youth and what the youth want. I'm a young person and I don't consider myself aligned with everyone who is the same age as me. Um, now, to my question, I, I am again hesitant with the way that partition has been deployed in this conversation. Um, partition, I think it's important to remember, was never an organic or a natural state of affairs for the region of historic Palestine. Um, when Resolution 181 was introduced, the, the first time that uh, partition had ever been suggested was actually in the Peel Commission 10 years prior. And so the fact that we have partition as the orthodoxy of um, of the Palestine-Israel conflict really merits, merits questioning. I think the fundamental question at the core of this, and this is what I'd like to propose to the panel this afternoon, is what does Zionism look like in the 21st century? Does it have a place in any future arrangement? My personal belief is not, and so the sooner we do away with the idea of an ethno-religious supremacy, I think the sooner we can get to the business of implementing justice and equality, partitioning the land, particularly for, um, for someone whose village was within uh, the 1948 territory, really doesn't uh, give us justice or equality, and therefore I don't think peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move here. Munir, go ahead. Please, very briefly, now we have to become really brief because of uh, uh, the time. Go ahead. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just another person who uh, is troubled with the idea of uh, uh, the Jewish state, specifically because uh, when Israel was created and became a Jewish state, it only uh, became a Jewish state because of displacing the overwhelming majority of the Palestinian people, of the non-Jewish inhabitants who lived in what became Israel after 1948. Um, and I think many of us here in the civil society are also, uh, also as Suhad expressed, but also within the occupied territory and in Jerusalem, we are struggling very hard against the real uh, uh, result of uh, the idea of the Jewish state, which is basically the, the continuous demographic uh, changes and engineering that is happening as a result of the Israeli law. So I just wanted to express this and thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have someone way in the back that's been waiting for quite some time. If they're still in the room, they're not in the room. Okay, please. Wayne. Before? Upstairs, upstairs. Oh, upstairs, yes. Uh, no, I have, I have someone here first, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, hello, I was wondering, um, with the two-state solution, uh, though it's just a proposal. Um, has Palestine ever thought about the outcomes that could come after they become a state? For example, when South Sudan became a country, ideally, after they left North Sudan, they would have been independent and they would have had an amazing, prosperous country. But instead, violence came about. Do you think violence will come about uh, if Palestine becomes uh, a state or a country one day? Thank you. Go ahead, please. Microphone, please. Raise your hand so they can see you. Raise your hand so they can see you. Go ahead. Voilà, je suis donc de la société civile. Hello, I'm from Senegalese Civil Society. I'd like to propose the propose. I'd like to support the proposals on non-governmental diplomacy. I'd like to support the efforts made towards the press and social movements. I read an article this morning that was published in Senegal on some way somebody called Henri Kouel, who is a Jew and pro-Palestinian who was assassinated 40 years ago. I think it is good to 
demonstrate these examples of people who fought for peace. The other article was this morning in the American press here on what's happening in Palestine. It was a newspaper from the Nation of Islam that I read this morning. I'd like to support the efforts involving women and young people. They represent the future and a good investment for peace. Trade unions and workers are also important. Because this, we, we have a debate on whether we should have one state or two states, but what's the position of the working classes? What's the position of workers, those who are labouring? It's important to include those people. In conclusion, we need to make sure that the conversations we've had in the last two days are disseminated and to show images and crimes, it's true, but also good images of solidarity. We need to have monitoring and we need to have evaluation of what we're doing. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I have three more. I would like you to please be telegraphic in, in your interventions and please don't request any more because we don't have time for any more additions. Please go ahead. One minute, please. Um, can you hear me? Um, Mr. Yes, I'd like to state that uh, I agree with you, Mr. Yusni Berlin, about negotiations being the platform towards peace. But negotiations have to come with willing partners planning to negotiate towards the settlement of peace. And the word is peace. And right now we have a situation uh, where Israel comes to the table unilaterally with certain demands and they expect that to uh, be agreeable to the other side. That is not acceptable. And I think it's about time that the State of Israel recognizes its responsibility as a member state under the United Nations Charter to stand up and be counted in the international community. Israel, as it stands, is in breach of international law. It's in breach of the law as we know it. And more importantly, uh, for the way forward, there has to be change within the state of Israel itself, which means within grassroots and the political establishment. We do not see that happening as it stands, which means change has to come within the Neset, within the political parties, within the government, within policies implemented by the government, and within the, the political spectrum, the whole political spectrum. Thank you. I yep. think, I think uh, the point is made. Yes, unless absolutely. You have other points, Thank you. Right? So please go ahead over here. No, 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 behind you. Yes. Thank you. I was um, just a bit, I wanted to express my frustration. Um, you know, I feel like we had a really productive panel this morning and a lot of great information came out. And then um, just to see from the represent representations of our leadership sort of uh, obsession with their own ego and talking about um, uh, and not answering the question, such as in the case of Suad or things like that. And I think that if we're going to come to the table and negotiate, we should actually talk about specific policy and address the points of the people that we're dialoguing with instead of responding to people and telling them that they should Google you. Because if they Googled you and then found your Oslo things, they would see that it failed. So there's really no point in doing that. And well. I don't appreciate you coming here and condescending to people in light of all that's going on in Palestine and all of the suffering and basically coming here with your massive ego that you haven't earned over years of political failure, failure and corruption and evilness. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's proceed, please. Um, I think let's keep uh, our discussions within civil parameters, if we can, please. Uh, I have one last uh, speaker. Where is it? Over here, please. Well, him first, then you, and that's it. No more. Because we have to have just the last thoughts from the panel, and then we have to finish at a time so we can close the sessions. Please go ahead. Sí. Primero... Muchas gracias por la, por la oportunidad. Voy a ser breve. Soy... I'll be very brief. I'm from Chile. 
First, I'd like to say that those from Oslo are a stage, a phase of the uh, colonial uh, leftist project. What we're trying to do is validate these projects within the international community while the col uh, colonization process continues. It's as if you're uh, negotiating on an apple, but one of the parties continues to eat the apple. Finally, we have no alternative, as we see. There's always the option that we have to work in civil society, what we're given after the boycott. And there are other problems, too. We have to deal with the anti-democratic state of Jewish state. We don't, we can call it what we will, the Jewish state. We don't, it doesn't matter whether you call it Islamic state. It's a state that doesn't, rec that doesn't respect the rights of the minority. So, accordingly, my question has, goes to uh, Ambassador Riyad Masur or anybody else, Candela. There's a plan B. There's an alternative. There are other strategies. Is that not true? In the field, there are other possibilities, are there not? Aren't there other ways to create a Palestinian state? And the last comment from the gentleman over here, please. Raise your hand so they can see. What, there you go. My name is Humberto Solis from Panama, civil society from Panama. We stand with Palestine, and we'd just like to say that we uh, stand with the Palestinian people because Panama was in a similar situation of occupation from 1903 on from the United States when international law was just being born, just coming into existence, hardly that at all. After 97 years of occupation, finally, we, got, we managed to drive the United States out, and now it's a question of compliance. There is international law today, but yesterday we were touching on this subject, and there was correct reference to the fact that here what we're doing is practically invoking magical laws. Religion is part of policy, we heard. And in this conflict, power holds sway. Human rights, human rights are being uh, disregarded. And now what I'd like to say is the following. What we've got to do is strengthen civil society. This puts pressure on governments. And so Panama is a good example of this. The president of Panama is in Palestine at the present time at an official meeting with the president of Palestine for the first time in history. This is happening. A president of Panama is making a visit of this kind. And I think this is significant that civil society is doing this, is propelling the situation forward. In, con in conclusion, either we demand compliance with international law or what we'll do is going back to magic esoteric things that don't really work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to bring it back to the panel now for just a, some closing thoughts, if you will, from each of our panelists. Uh, I must say I'm uh, a little bit disappointed that the conversation kind of moved away from our purpose for the panel, which is to really think about uh, some possible ways forward uh, towards achieving sustainable peace, towards creating change, and we got kind of trapped back into our, our uh, vicious cycles of, of discussion, which I suppose is uh, unavoidable, but uh, hopefully uh, the closing remarks from our panelists may bring us back a little bit to what they take away from the discussion in terms of possible ideas for the future. Uh, we've got four panelists, and basically we're talking about only about a minute and a half for each to just give it to us from the end, as we say in Arabic, uh, the very final sum total of your thoughts on this. And I'd like to start from uh, Mr. Palin uh, first and then move the other way because we always move this way first. I'm ending this meeting very much encouraged by what I held here. The world is with you. The Jewish organizations in America are with you. 
the superpowers are with you, the administration here is with you, the Arab world is totally with you from Saudi Arabia to some other countries in the surrounding. And you really don't need neighbors of the Palestinians to help establishing the Palestinian state. So thank you. I think that we come here recognizing that Israel and Palestine are not two countries debating a contested border. We are talking about an occupied people and an occupier. And that's very different. Israel stands in violation of a host of international laws. If we look at the situation in Gaza in recent days, these are war crimes. And I think what that means for all of us at the diplomatic level, at the international level, and particularly from my vantage point at the civil society level, because I agree with the colleague from Panama about the importance of civil society in pushing our governments to bring all kinds, all kinds of nonviolent pressure to bear on Israel, economic, political, diplomatic, in every arena, to end those violations. It's not about hoping that somehow the, the parties in Israel, different parties, will be elected. That may happen, it may not. We know that more settlements happened under labor than under Likud in the early years, so this is not necessarily a guarantee anyway. But I do think that as civil society and international diplomats, the United Nations and at the individual country level, we have an enormous obligation, not just to talk about international <coughs> law, but to use it as a tool. It, it strengthens our power and our arguments with our own governments. It forces confrontations with our media to recognize that what we have here is not simply a conflict between two peoples. We're not, this is not Peru and Ecuador arguing over a border crossing. This is an occupied population, occupied land, and an occupier next door with nuclear weapons and the support of the most powerful, wealthiest country that has ever existed in the history of the world. That's a huge challenge for all of us. But if we work together as civil society and the United Nations and some governments, I think we may have a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ambassador Mansour. One quickly to questions. Not to go the route of uh, UC Berlin and uh, Phyllis. Uh, somebody asked, uh, when South Sudan spl split from North Sudan, they're having civil war. There are many countries that uh, acquired independence, but they did not descend to civil war. We hope and we expect that when once Palestine is independent, that we are not going to go the route of South Sudan. The route of many others, Namibia and others, they did not descend into civil war. Uh, what is the future of Zionism? I think that I was hoping that uh, uh, Mr. UC Berlin would respond to it, but I believe that uh, from the perspective, like a perspective of mine, a Palestinian perspective, that Zionism is an evolving concept. Now there is a serious threat against Zionism from extremist element within Israel itself that is going way beyond Zionism into the fantasy of uh, uh, religious, biblical, you know, promise that God gave them la the land 3,000 years ago, and therefore Zionism is not acceptable to them. So that, that is one of the challenges that Zionism is facing. But then I think that, uh, that uh, UC Berlin is more qualified than me to speak about this subject. Workers are including in the Palestine Liberation Organization and they have quota representation. So their view as representing the working class among the Palestinian people is reflected within the PLO structure. Uh, other ways of having, if I understood the question of uh, uh, a Palestinian state, there is no way other than the, the hard way of struggling all of us, those who are in the land and those who are in other places each from their own uh, location, you have to struggle according to your own situation and contribute to the collective struggle of the Palestinian people that would lead to uh, accomplishing the objective of ending occupation 
and the independence of the state of Palestine. Sustainable peace, that is the theme. I gave a speech in the General Assembly on the High Forum of Sustainable Peace. And I raised the rhetorical question. You might be surprised why a representative of the state of Palestine, people living under occupation, how, why are they participating in the debate? I raised that question. And I said, the reason why we are participating in the debate because we have hope. We don't know how to live under peace, so therefore we don't know how to sustain something that we never enjoyed. But nevertheless, because we have hope, and we, ha we hope that one day we have peace with our neighbors, especially Israel, and therefore to have this concept of peace, and therefore I will be more qualified to talk about sustainable peace once we enjoy peace. We are not there yet, so I am not qualified to speak about sustainable peace. Thank you very much, and you know, I think we will be moving to the closing remarks. We will be if we give... Uh, uh, <laughs> You, yeah. They left you basically half a minute to a minute. That's yeah, no, that's, I've left. that's more than enough. It's, it's all about substance. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for their interest in the Palestinian cause, but also the support. Um, and in three words, invest in Palestine. Come open a business. Yeah, yeah. Wait, start an exchange program with Palestinian universities. Give a, start a visa waiver program with Palestine. Actions. Because on the other side, they're taking actions that are very loud. So we need actions that are going to create a new reality that the occupation is going to face. This is how um, I would like to end the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, I'm happy to hand the microphone back to Ambassador Rodriguez for uh, essentially the closing session of this conference. Thank you very much. No, indeed, sir. The applause are for you and the panelists because I have not said my closing <laughs> remarks yet. I will be very brief. I have some notes from the from the committee that are the, the secretariat that are always very efficient to to prepare us, but I will change it a little bit because the discussion has you you put it here that was indeed insightful. I would change it that for a word that has been indeed interesting, <laughs> and we have had everything here, deep reflections, legal analysis of uh, the different perspectives and situations, a lot of arguments, arguments, ironic comments, very emotive reactions. But uh, I think that uh, all of those uh, features of the debate that we have just had uh, is a demonstration of the complexity of the issue and the great challenge that we have ahead as the international community. And I deeply remain hopeful, hopeful that the voice of reason on all sides would uh, triumph in, del in delivering a just peace for the people of Palestine. Let us, as the conclusion of this debate, reiterate our call and turn our efforts to respecting international law. International law has been mentioned more than once by everybody, by any of us here or by each of us to achieve justice and fulfill the inalienable rights and legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people. The international community is in debt. We all are in debt with the Palestinian people and we all has an unwavering commitment to Palestine. It is our collective responsibility to spare no effort to end the occupation and injustice. It is time for genuine and concerted action. Let's do it without delay. Thank you very much. <laughs> now I, I, I kindly ask you to, to state uh, that sit down, uh, which, will, which will now suspend uh, for it, uh, one minute. It says here two minutes, but let's say only one minute to permit the panel to leave the podium and myself, and allow me to invite the chair of the committee and the representative of Palestine to stay at the podium for the closing session. Thank you very much.
Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers panélistes. Ladies and gentlemen, panelists. This beautiful uh, gathering would like to hear is another speech. So I'm not make a speech. I'll just hand over the floor to our special panelists, Ambassador Yad Mansour, and then we close this very, very interesting two days forum on the issue of Palestine. Ambassador, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we finish these four days of uh, very successful uh, activities at the United Nations commemorating the 70 years of Nakba, we started with a concert and we had a meeting for the civil society organizations, brainstorming, and then we had two days of uh, panels from a combination of representative of governments and uh, experts and civil society. We are very grateful to the committee for organizing such an event in the midst of the tragic events unfolding on the Gaza Strip, and in fact, in the midst of that massacre that have taken place on the 14th, 15th of May in the Gaza Strip, which took us to the Security Council and took us you know, to other places, including the Council in Human Rights, in which today they voted to form a fact-finding mission to investigate the crimes committed by Israel against the civilian population in the Gaza Strip. And we are in the midst of negotiation in New York through the Security Council on a draft resolution to provide uh, protection, international protection, for the civilian population under occupation. In the midst of all these things, you had your meetings here. Uh, it was a somber, you know, uh, uh, atmosphere maybe even atmosphere where anger was, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, justified because people are upset for the reason of what, uh, what is happening in the Gaza Strip. But let me just say that we thank the committee for organizing these activities and these conferences. We thank the division. We thank all those who contributed to the success of these meetings and this conference. We also are very uh, grateful to all the panelists who have shared in a very uh, courageous you know, uh, way uh, their thoughts and ideas in a, in a, a very you know, uh, free way. You know. Some of these ideas uh, could be interpreted as uh, critical to certain conducts or thinking. Other ideas are uh, uh, you know, on the basis of goodwill contributing to uh, try to deal with the very complicated situation on the ground. We appreciate all these ideas. We appreciate all this effort. We're always looking for creative new ideas to help us to advance the cause of the Palestinian people forward. Even the idea of citizenship of 1924, we will explore it very thoroughly and see if we can legislate something to that effect. effect we will not hesitate to do so. So we will look at all practical ideas to help us to move forward to advance the cause of the Palestinian people. We will study them seriously and we will see what is possible to implement. Let me just tell you that we are going through very difficult times. This is an understatement to say that. Very, very difficult times. We need the help of every and each one of you from your own perspective, in your own domain, in the way that you feel comfortable for working to advance the cause of justice, we need your help. The Palestinian people need your help. Those who are in the Gaza Strip need your help to contribute to the efforts to put an end to that blockade for 10 years. They need your, we need your help to pressure us to unify our ranks. We need your help in order to open new doors for advancing the cause of the Palestinian people. 
and we mean that very genuinely. We are not competing with anyone. We don't want anyone to compete with anyone else. We all complement each other. We have a monumental task before us that requires every possible energy to be invited to the, the long march for advancing the cause of justice for the Palestinian people. So any, any useful idea, any creative idea, any useful new idea, we welcome. Because we are very, very eager in order to put an end to the misery after 70 years, the misery of our people, after 70 years of occupation, 51 years of, of the Nakba, 51 years of occupation, and 25 years of the Oslo uh, agreement. The difficult times would require from us to support the Palestinian people to steadfast in the ground. The critical time require from all of you not to let the people in Gaza to be alone, not to let the Palestinian people in the occupied territory to be alone, not to let the refugees to be alone, not to let the Palestinian Israelis to be alone, not to let those who fight for justice and peace inside Israel, regardless of their religion and national affiliation, to be alone. They need your help, they need your solidarity, and they need your uh, uh, effort. With that spirit, we thank you so much for everything that has taken place during the last few days, and the march will continue. And we will, I can assure you that the Palestinian people will not vanish. They will not leave their homeland and they will continue the struggle in spite of all the difficult conditions that they are going through and will be going through. The move of the embassy is a shameful thing, illegal thing done by the US administration. It is our collective responsibility to uphold international law and to make it an isolated incident and not to be supported by other states to open embassies. I know that we have people from Guatemala, for example, with us, civil society, from other countries. We need your help. We need your intensified efforts in order to reverse that decision and not to allow the government to open an embassy in, in Jerusalem. Use all the creative ideas possible, including legal options. I know that you are working on some uh, legal options in the court system inside Guatemala. We need to learn from that uh, experience and to see how it could be used uh, by other countries to deter their governments from considering the illegal idea of moving the embassy. So we have a tall order before us, but I am sure that everyone in this room came to this effort, to this conference with the view of trying to help the struggle of the Palestinian people, and we appreciate that. We thank you for that and we will work with you very closely. Look at the resolutions that we adopt, a minimum of 16 every year, 13 of them of a political nature. Dissect each resolution, study it thoroughly, especially those who are legalists among you. If you see that there are missing things, advise us. We will deal with it with an open mind and an open heart. We will try to improve our work as much as we can and we will look at serious uh, 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 ideas and contributions with, with, uh, with, with all the attention that it requires. We're always looking for ways to advance our work and to improve our work. You are friends and you owe it to us to give us the results of your brain and it, we promise you to look at it very seriously and see what can fit and we will uh, implement, and what cannot fit, we will tell you why we cannot do it. We are very transparent. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. It has been very hectic, but la lucha continua for those who speak in Spanish. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Riyad. You said it all. People are already standing up. Uh, we, we just want to repeat our appreciation uh, to all of you, the panelists, 
the Secretariat, the civil society, but especially to interpreters. Uh, Mansur Riyad forgot to, to, highlight, to highlight two points. The very dire situation of UNRWA, which is a lifeline for many millions of Palestinians. Also, this committee is embarked on providing a training program for Palestinian cadres. Palestine has been designated at the next G77 president for next year. They will need all the support they, uh, uh, required because Chair is a group of 77 negotiating almost two thirds or three quarters of the UN uh, program is no easy job. Uh, I also want to conclude by saying <coughs> the young man who was uh, at the last panel here is inviting us to become pragmatic, efficient, action oriented. This committee has learned a lot. Last year's forum was extraordinary. This is extraordinary also. You have told us, you have taught us how to improve ourselves. Uh, we, we take the challenge that inshallah, next forum next year will be uh, better than this one. And we hope, Ambassador Riyadh, uh, it will be during your chairmanship of Group of 767. So I will take you to Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. With those words, I declare this forum uh, closed. Thank you all. Safe return. Congratulations, Chair. Hello. Thank you.